right. Do you think they need a bit of help? There's quite uh, a few people still out there. Yeah, looks like. Do you want to jump across and just coach them all in um, to the English breakout rooms? Uh, was the screen being shared in the main room about uh, jumping into the, yeah? Okay. Oh, no, well, people no, are coming, can, people are coming through now, so that's cool. Okay. They're coming okay. through into the different uh, rooms, so that's all right. Um, this might be just you and I. <laughs> we can have a chat. <laughs> We can. I, I, yeah. So this is which I, I, I need to get back to you on several things. Yeah. <laughs> ditto, 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 and ditto again. Yes. <laughs> we need to have a little talk. <laughs> when can um, we um, have a meeting? Um, totally up to you, really. Uh, I should be able to fit in. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll except, oh, wait on. Um, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, after that, I'm out for a week. Um, so, um, because I've got meetings end to end down on Wellington. So, uh, let's see, are people coming across yet? Uh, getting there? Only 11 people left. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. Um, so, whatever suits you. Um, so, we need to have a good chat um, on things. Yeah. Um, you're saying Tuesday, Wednesday works? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, cool. Well, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday um, is fine. I've got okay. a ton of stuff to do tomorrow. Um, so it's probably not a good time, but um, my, my, my Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Okay. I'll be out from the 19th to the 26th. Yeah, that's right. You did say that. 19th to the 26th. Yep. That's okay. So Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday works for me. Cool. All right. Um, that's cool, cool. Who else? We still got a few more people in the main room. Shall I sign them? Shall I sign your mum to you here? <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> and Evan's from Tanzania. Is he? Uh, Evan, they're probably going, what are they doing? Uh, Jojo W, I have no idea. Who's uh, Christopher? Someone um, kicked me out here. What happened here? No, I didn't kick you out. Were you in the main room? Oh, oh, do you want me to put you back in the main room? Lynn, you're muted. Yeah. That's all right. See, see, now we can appreciate Felix's adept use of Zoom. It's a learning process for all of us. <laughs> As we sort of try and figure things out. Yeah. So uh, we can figure that. Hello, Evan. Hello, Anne. We were not able to. Hello, Robert. We had the issue. Hello, right. but now. Uh, what, we, could, we, could not, we could not get in. Oh, there were no really? breakout rooms. There was no oh, indication yeah. for us to join. Oh, okay. We were kind of, but you to let us in manually. Oh, right. Okay. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, right. So, uh, because Lynn hasn't got the video up um, on the breakout room. So, that's okay. Um, we'll figure that out. We're just learning Zoom. That's what we're doing. You might have, you would have thought that we'd figured it all out by now. <laughs> this is my break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just I, I completely, like in the moment, completely lost track of everything I was supposed to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Absolutely no worries. Nothing there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, how is everyone? You know, um, uh, you know how, how you all... Uh, happy, disappointed, frustrated. What's the what's the prognosis after Fund Seven? We have zero point one six projects funded. Point uh, one six. Oh, like <clears throat> does that make any sense? Sixteen percent. Sixteen percent. Okay. Oh, Felix is in here. Um, so you had sixteen percent of them funded. So what does that translate to? To I saw there was a podcast one for Ethiopia. Um, and uh, what else? It's four out of 25. Four out of 25. Okay. Mm. We've got to do a bit better, eh? Um, yeah. That's all right. I got all funded right. for one little one. Yeah. Um, yeah, all right. I got funded for the African children. African cool. children. <laughs> Excellent. How did you go, Evans? Did you did you get any any uh, of yours? 
No, not really. Ours did in person. Okay. Yeah. Now, but what I would say is, like, quite literally, the one that Lynn called out took me four times. And I wasn't. So did you, did you put it back in the same way or did you keep improving it? Um, most, what I really changed was just the title and often just okay. orientated it towards the challenge. Um, you okay. know, I mean, so, yeah. I, I, you know, the way I actually write them is I look very carefully at the challenges themselves. I don't go in and, um, you know, because fundamentally what, who you're actually writing to is the CAs, they're your audience. That, that's the reality of it, right? Um, Robert, because they, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Felix is saying he can't join from the main room. Can't he? Can you, can you yeah. add him to the incoming? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, he's coming in and I'm going to go, um, Felix, you're the expert. <laughs> um, so, hello. It's weird. Uh, so you couldn't get in? Uh, no. There was no Make breakout room. Um, there was no breakout room indication at the bottom. There was no way of no. There was nothing. There was no. What? How, what exactly. do you call that icon? Ah, the one that says breakout. Yeah, breakout room. Up. It's on. Exactly. It's yeah. on my screen. Um, so, uh, master, master um, Felix, how do I do? <laughs> how do I manage things in uh, in Zoom <laughs> uh, to do that? Uh, so there was obviously something going on. But, uh, yeah, when you. When you set up the rooms, the, you yeah. have three options. And when you set up the rooms, you have the option to say, let participants choose the room. Yeah, I did that. If you did? That's yeah, weird. I, then I did that. they all should be fine. Yeah. Um, mm. So I made sure of doing that. Oh, well, uh, we'll have a bit of a practice um, again. <laughs> You're here now, and that's what matters. Um, you have a geeky computer that's blocking things in the background. <laughs> yeah that's all right yeah my mouse ran out power um so yes what i did was um that particular proposal was put up literally about four times right? and um and that was okay um uh, and i didn't mind too much um because they were all quite technical and so therefore they needed a certain amount of um, promotion and communication about what they were right? what that proposal was uh, because of the design of catalyst the way that it operates is um, really this idea that um, over time the community learns um, by being exposed to the proposals as a CA, for example, um, you read these proposals and you start to pick up terms and you start to pick up a, a mm. way of doing things or what your expectations are. And over time, mm. the community gets better in principle. Mm. This is the idea in principle gets better because then we start learning more by just participating in the review process and the whole process itself. Um, and so in many respects, you've just kind of got to go with that flow. Um, you've got to make people aware of what you're trying to achieve. That's why we do the idea fest. That's why we do, um, you know, the town halls, um, is to give you guys an opportunity to discuss your, uh, ideas, your situation, um, and what you're trying to achieve. Um, so, uh, and in the process of doing the insight phase, for example, it's about setting up collaboration and reaching out to people and just saying, hey, I've seen your um, idea, I like that. And it's about seeding ideas. And then when we go into the process drafting phase, uh, again, commenting, people commenting on things, interacting, even through Discord and um, all the other uh, Telegram channels are important. Um, so for example, I actually, in the proposals that I got funded, I actually, this time I chose to do very little promotion. Um, that, uh, mainly because I, I kind of do an experiment myself. I want to see how people learn and understand things. And I was also a bit cheeky, right? Because I, I know that 
most people will read the um, title. They will look at the, review, the star rating. Um, and most of the other details are somewhat irrelevant. You know, they'll dig in and, and that sort of thing from the voting point of view. Um, so the title is probably the most important thing to get right uh, from the voting app point of view. Um, and then the bulk of your proposal material that you're writing for, you're, you're actually writing for the CAs, not for the voters, you're writing for the CAs because it's the CAs that will come through and review it. And you're actually trying to help them learn as much as anything else, all right? Felix. Yeah, I think it's fucking important what you mentioned here, because one thing as well is, I think for a successful proposal, you need to understand the language of the voter. I followed it now through the last three funding rounds since climate change exists. And no man is omen. Empowering a woman in, climate change in has direct it triggers some people in the community and there's a huge fucking against world and somehow sad to say but for those projects they will constantly receive uh, against votes simply they used to because they used the wrong terms and this is kind of extremely interesting to observe through the challenges and different funding rounds that really no man is omen and like <laughs> like Robert said, to most of the voters, they read the title, they read the 140 character description, and that's it. They do not read the proposal. So, yeah. so understanding the voter language, I think it's super important. Yeah, voter language, so yeah, the process itself and what you're doing to engage and that sort of things. And don't give up, as I said, the, um, the proposals themselves. Um, so I put up a proposal up in fund two, which I knew wouldn't get voted because I basically was asking for half the fund. And that was intentional um, for various different reasons, right? But what I wanted to do uh, was make sure that, um, uh, you know, I could establish a, uh, a standard in a sense. So it was actually quite a high quality proposal. Um, and there were various things in there. Um, what was most interesting was actually looking at the voting on it was there was a huge amount of people that voted it up, but there was equally a lot of people that voted it down. And you could argue that's, I, I argued that that was actually the correct decision, right, to vote it down because it was asking for half the fund. The fund too was only 250,000 or something like that, 200,000. Um, and uh, there was also the core of the proposal was in trying to basically educate people around some of the features of Cardano, because at the time, no one knew what F NFTs were. Um, most people were focused on DeFi. No one knew anything about um, actually how the Cardano blockchain worked. They all just thought it was Ethereum, uh, you know, version number, you know, number version. They didn't know anything about the extended UTXO um, they didn't understand anything about market mechanisms and things like that. So I intentionally put that proposal up. Uh, it was more of an exercise to help people um, view things. So um, I've just got uh, people coming in, so I'll just assign them. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, assign to Vietnamese. Um, so. And then I've referred to that proposal subsequently as they've come through, as I've done the other proposals that I actually wanted to work on. Um, but understanding the language um, and the process is really, really helpful. So how I've, I, I could argue that I've actually uh, been a little too successful in my proposals because we got all the Eastern Town Hall ones in Fund 6 that we pretty much put up, except for the grow, the challenge one. Um, we've, um, and I've, I've received a, a number of projects that I'm working on at the moment that have been funded. Um, well, they're all one project, but parts of it. Um, the, the process that I go through um, is first of all, I, I really analyze the challenge. I, I pull it apart, right? Um, 
I, I pull out all the features, I analyze the words, I literally look for all the phrasing that's used in it. I'll read the comments, if there's any around the challenge and the, how it was um, you know, voted for. And so I really, really try to understand the challenge. And in answer to your question, Anne, then I, in this case for the, uh, um, the one that got funded there was, the, um, it's gone through different names, had different titles. It's the same proposal, just different titles. And I've tweaked the proposal to meet the needs of the challenge, emphasizing the language that's in the challenge and the language of the community overall, what I think the community understands. So I might go out into Telegram and try and understand, we see what they're talking about and move uh, through those sort of areas. Um, and work out what's going on. Some proposals I do not think will get funded, right? Um, but I'm trying to establish something. So particularly like the, the challenge setting ones. Um, so I'm putting them up there because I know CAs will read them. Um, and therefore CAs, even though you may not have the same CA in, in the subsequent funds, um, you see what's coming through. The reviews, love them or hate them, that come through from the CAs, because um, I get some real doozies <laughs> uh, coming through, uh, do take them seriously because they create the language um, that is necessary for to end up in your proposals. I, I think the biggest insight in all of this is this, is that this entire space is new, not just a blockchain, but even the engaging in, say, an innovation process like Catalyst itself is new. And the fact that we're also trying to figure out how to value things in a different way by locally different communities. Um, so we've got to try and find language that meets those criteria. Um, in addition, I know how the CAs have, are required to review it, they're required to have auditability, you know, impact and those sort of things. So I structure the proposals to answer those questions as directly as I possibly can. Um, and I keep them in a very structured form. Um, and so they're, they're very consistent right across. And that's what I do. So if you go and look at any of my proposals, and there's quite a few up there, you'll see that there's actually a language in the structure of them. Uh, going through over time. So um, those, those, that's just the way I, I uh, approach it. Um, I did not expect the bonding curve proposal, which is the Dow one, to be funded this time even, but it did. So, hey, Angela. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, really, like, I'm happy for you. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, we'll Detail. see. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, and I, oh, I just wanted to ask, I don't know if Felix has the same question or if I'm leading. It seems to me like there are trigger words. Uh, girls, women, diversity uh, that automatically get filtered up. Um, I get that the whole larger idea is supposed to be decentralization, but I also get that the people who are currently in charge have no interest at all whatsoever. As they've said many times in this room, I'm not interested in Africa. I have no interest whatsoever in, you know, the far, far flung corners of the earth. What would be the best? Because I felt like boosting diversity in Catalyst, for example, as an example, was kind of covered. Uh, it was under a veil of. Um, <laughs> here, here's, I don't know. Here, here's I'm my thoughts. Myself. I'm not yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Um, here's my thought. Uh, there's a number of views that you've got within the space. And I'm not, I don't just mean Catalyst. I mean the cryptocurrency space. First of all, it's dominated by tech bros, right? 
uh, really is. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes it so interesting to me for Catalyst itself, the Catalyst process itself, is it's not strictly dominated by tech pros. But outside of Catalyst, and remember Catalyst is actually only a small part of the overall Cardano community, it is. Uh, and, and they're not even tech bros, I'll call them token flipping bros. You know, the, the chads, the, the, the DGENs, the, the board yacht club apes, whatever they want to call themselves. You know, um, and they've got a particular ideology, right? Um, that they are, you know, they know best, they're in it to, to make yield or whatever it is. And so if it doesn't fit that narrative, it's going to get downvoted. So, for example, that one that got funded in, uh, this time around was first put into the DeFi challenge uh, that it went into, and it got heavily downvoted right, the first time. And that was because it didn't fit the narrative of what DeFi was for the community at that time. Okay, And so there's, unfortunately, they hold the voting power in, in terms of when people are coming through and things like that. Um, that's also a downside of the um, way that voting is done at the moment, okay? That it's plutocratic and that it's all direct democracy. Um, so uh, that's why we've got to figure out different ways. Felix, I could carry on on this topic, Angela, so, but I, I'm conscious of um, Felix had his hand up. So I'm interested on what you have. Uh, to this topic, I think there are two other things to consider as well. Once the reputation, the reputation patterns now becomes crucial. All, for example, the proposals I was coordinating in this round, and we made the first draft the last round as well. And it's the second point then. The proposals are coordinated, not only your core proposals. For example, in this round, Eastern Town Hall, Bridge Builders, Ambassadors, Catalyst Swarm, Catalyst School, AIM, we call like last round. Some of the projects haven't been there. All our proposals are coordinated. We check with the teams which proposal goes in which challenge, how much budget do you ask? We don't want to compete with each other in idea scale. We do so if we don't coordinate. All of the proposals already in last funding round have been coordinated. And you just need some people for this, right? Who, who uh, do you just need to check with some people for it, those who who run the, uh, the, the Catalyst School, for example, or AI. And last funding round was already the experience we got more than 70% of all the proposals funded. We went on this funding round and we got almost 80% of all proposals funded. From the reputation side of you, well-known people from the community on the proposal increase immensely the likelihood to get voted and funded. All the ambassador proposals got voted and funded, I submitted. All the Catalyst Swarm proposals, except that one. All the Eastern Town Hall proposals got voted and funded. All the Bridge Builders proposals got voted and funded. All the Catalyst School proposals got voted and funded. I think overall, we activated around 400,000 US dollars across all the different projects because it's coordinated. And because four topics where we know, oh, okay. For example, Angela, a perfect example about women, right? It's the Leadership Academy. You are part of this. Leadership Academy now is a funded proposal as well. And nobody knows Leadership Academy. It's only a group of women who speaks about <laughs> really the topics where when, we, when I would put it in a proposal, nobody would vote for it, right? Okay, no, not nobody, but there would be immense again, against us. So first, again, the, low language, the, the voting language, Leadership Academy. Even the tech guys say, oh, yes, leadership for color. Yes, mentors, we are leaders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, it's only women who are executing this proposal. Do you know this? No, better not. OK. But really crucial part is coordinate the proposals in aligned with the other projects you're already collaborating with. Because this allows you mostly really to, because you never know how much up and down votes you will receive. And you have to calculate for the leftover algorithm as well in Catalyst. Means you have the challenge with the total full budget, 
And now the proposals get voted and they are ranked in, in, within that challenge. The first place will be the, the proposal with the highest upvotes and the less downvotes. This proposal takes the first chunk out of the challenge. Okay, the rest of the budget, step by step, duck, 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 is distributed like this to the proposals. Now, in all of the challenges, it's each time comes to the situation where they say, okay, 50,000 are still left after the highest ranked got their pot. And now the next proposal who is in the line asks for 60,000. It doesn't fit anymore to the budget, right? So he is voted, but not fun. The voting algorithm will go to the next one now and will select proposals which fits to the leftover budget. So you calculate your proposal in alignment with the other proposals which are in the challenge. You readjust the budget because you know, okay, which likelihood will I be in which rank? You check already also the other proposals which are in the challenges where you don't know the people behind or you know the people behind, but you're not directly collaborating with them. So you know, oh, okay, this might be a very strong proposal, might get voted and funded and this as well, and this as well. And then you adjust your proposals all around the line to ensure that you, even when you have not enough votes, you fit into the leftover algorithm. So um, as a as a kind of competitive fund, you see, we've got to be mindful. You start to learn the language, you start to learn the strategies, and those sort of things. I I will be looking. I haven't looked at the results properly, but I was disappointed to find all the the women and uh, the climate ones weren't funded. But I hadn't looked at them myself properly. Uh, in terms of analysing them and trying to think about how they could be written better uh, to appeal to the different uh, groups. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something I'll try and have a look at. Um, but there's also generally a problem with um, this idea of direct democracy. Um, so when, when does, uh, Felix, when does the delegated voting come in? Uh, soon, I think. Yeah. And um, so that might change the dynamics quite a bit. Um, so we can delegate voting power to certain people um, to vote on our behalf. And um, so, you know, that's that's one, uh, that's certainly going to be one change. Uh, Another? Yeah. Another huge change, definitely for the challenges, is... For example, in the challenges we saw last funding round, for example, when developer ecosystem is not voted, right? It harms a direct, it really harms the community. So somehow we have to make sure that challenges are voted as well, right? And there is a lot of changes and things coming now because the challenges are a little bit the, the ground which allows us already to submit our proposals in the right topics, right? If we don't have the challenges who fits to our project, we will struggle already to submit effective proposals, right? They might be great, but they will, might not be totally authentic to the challenge itself. So how to ensure that we have the right challenges in place as well, right? And we're voting. And when it comes to voting delegation, it also comes, all voting delegation only works when you have experts, right? When you have people to who the votes can be delegated and then are able to make a very good decision in behalf of the people who delegate the votes to them. And I don't know if you recognized, but in Fund 7, it was the first time Cardano Foundation voted. I didn't notice they, that. That's interesting. Because uh, this conversation has since a while with Cardano Foundation, and uh, because mm. they, they asked, hey, should Cardano Foundation vote in Catalyst? My response was, while the, the worst participation in governance is to not participate, for me, the question is not if Cardano Foundation votes. The question is, how do they legitimate their vote? Hmm. How do they make their vote? If it's only two people in Cardano Foundation have no clue about Catalyst, they shouldn't never even consider to vote, right? 
Well, what we did is we uh, made a survey on the very beginning of Fund 7 Challenge, a challenge review and ranking, where we got over almost 100 answers from people, they ranked the challenges. These challenges have been voted on by Cardano Foundation at the end of the challenges. We have been very careful, so only with 15 million, only on some challenges and only upwards, not downwards. Hmm. The thing now is that they, because they registered already 170, 170 million ADA to vote, we said, whoa, 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 no, 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 170 million is not a vote, it's a decision. You can't do this, especially not on the first time. Well, the things Cardano Foundation definitely wants to use the treasury, they could vote with 700 million. The thing is that they need a community to define the process. Hmm. If they vote so, and now that's the thing, because this will move on now over the next funding rounds as well. So we plan to increase the, let's say, voting weight of CF in each funding round. The thing is to define a process where the community, where really experts from within the community are able to make a very strong state and a very strong rationale which challenges should be voted and why. Only a certain amount, let's say stick to five, something like this. The community makes the decision, handles it over to CF, and they are totally agreed to then simply execute the decision of the community, mm. and they will vote with their power. And this is something extremely interesting who might change a lot, a lot in the community as well. Because now you have a direct access to, to a certain decision-making power. And the main goal is not that you want, don't want to include, like in Catalyst voting, everybody, for example. I'm mostly very against voting because in Catalyst, I have the possibility to vote for and against everything I want. Well, if I don't know anything about DeFi, I shouldn't even have the right to vote about it, right? Because my vote would be so useless. <laughs> like, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? So why do I have the right to vote? That doesn't make sense. And when I want to say, hey, okay, how to make really good decisions, I need somehow an expert's opinion who know really well about Catalyst itself already by experience, who know about Cardano, who know about the topics then, about the domains and everything. I think this is something where also Eastern Town Hall might have an important role also to say, hey, here you have opinions from local communities, right? What we not really have in Cardano yet. With Eastern Town Hall, we we create this format, right, where people can have a deep understanding of Catalyst, how it works, participate and everything. But yeah, just want to say that uh, definitely this expert structures where people, high school people, high profiles come together, brainstorm together, make a decision together by best will and knowledge. This will have more and more impact on the community. We will move away also from individuals with own projects. They will struggle a lot in the future to come in. Newcomers, new projects to establish, they will struggle a lot in the future to come in. They will not seem that they will miss the attention of the voters and with this also their votes, right? And already the participation of a vote, how many wallets vote for your proposal is fucking crucial already. Another thing as well is that from the registered votes, only a minimum of the registered votes actually votes. I think this funding round, we are on 6% of all registered votes who actually voted. This is ridiculous. 6%? Six. Six yes. Really? Huh? This is ridiculous. What is happening there? Why? Well, one thing where we think a lot about is, yeah, those are people, when you go into voting, and now you have 900 proposals, Fuck, you don't even start, right? You, found, well, you want to find proposals who fit to your interests and all, yeah, show them a way to find them. Totally yeah. lost. And again, the experts now will play an extremely right. important role in the future. Yeah. So that actually came up um, in the voting. So what I do each voting round, I have a few wallets that have just got a small amount in them. And I use it as a, a way to bring people into Cardano and start thinking about it. 
uh, to get them to vote is I've found to be quite a successful way to get people interested because you can say, well, you know, you can just go through and it's like they've got about a thousand ages sitting in there and they can go off and vote. So it's pretty small. Um, and so this time I gave it to an ex-minister of our government. She's just resigned. And uh, so she was uh, going through and uh, asking me all sorts of questions about the process. She got lost, first of all. So I was helping her through and just suggesting which ones to go and look at and travel through. But she was quite lost, and, but she was so keen to try it out because she was actually. Um, and so she was working through that. And then after she'd voted, she was asking me all sorts of questions about was it proportional? How did it work? And those sort of things. She was really getting into it uh, to try and figure out what was going on. So. Um, I hope to have a further talk with her. Um, I, I missed the meeting I was supposed to have with her last week because uh, time zones, uh, time I should say. Um, but I'm, I'm keen to talk to her and understand what her process was in terms of what she thought. But one of the things in terms of all the messages and stuff I was getting from her was it seemed a bit overwhelming. You know, where do I start? Where do I go? What do I do? That side of things. So with lots and lots of votes, lots of different challenges, it's overwhelming, even just the voting side of things. Um, and like uh, Jack didn't want to vote this time. He just oh no, there's too much. So I voted for him. <laughs> That's like Anne. I'm curious to know, um, someone like Angela, you voted for the first time. What was your experience like? Was it overwhelming? So like when we talk about democratic processes, um, how easy is it for people to vote? If it's 6% of the people, that means it's not incentivized somehow. People are not sensitized to come out and vote. People don't have the passion. As you're saying, it's, it could be just people who want to yield some money out of their ADA. And they're not really interested in this whole Cardano community business. It's like some business going on on the side that they couldn't be bothered about. So one, Angela, what was your experience like the first time? And secondly, in terms of democracy, 6% um, of people turning voter turnout, <laughs> that's pretty low. So how do you deal with that? Like, um, it's a bit disturbing actually. You gonna answer, Angela? <laughs> hmm. Well, it's it's uh it's an experience, isn't it? Catalyst. <laughs> Catalyst is an experience, and it's been overwhelming over and over and over and over again. And so you kind of as you move along, get stronger in dealing with the overwhelm, even if it's only slightly. And so you kind of have to, I have kind of had to uh, grow, get over myself, make decisions and have a focus to which I am, uh, have, have a goal to which, it's like it's, it's like a journey and, and you have to be, believe in where you're going to deal with the mess on the way. And so, yes, it is messy. Uh, again, I'm talking in metaphor. I don't know, because the point is not to tell you who I voted for, is it? Is, that's, not, that's not the question. But as a process, Catalyst is immensely overwhelming to me personally. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm only still here because I believe in the end goal, the end goal being a better Africa, the end goal being, um, you know, regardless of whether I believe in democracy or not, or, you know, voting or the whole process. I'm participating because to me, the end goal is very clear. And so I'm willing, I'm willing to deal with, with 
what happens between on the way but not everyone has a clear place that they're traveling to and so they may be agreeable for example when faced with a list of uh, things to vote for they may be disagreeable when they see someone they don't like they may be or you know uh, i don't know Okay, thank you for that. So, so if that means that there needs to be maybe a lot of sensitization, maybe a fund for helping voters, is there one for a challenge? <laughs> Not the thing about it is every 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 new person that comes in is like, I just went through a hell of an onboarding experience, and every new person's first proposal is let's do onboarding. Everybody, everyone who votes for the first time is like, this is a mess. Let's do something about it. They don't get voted in. Uh, so <laughs> we know we know the issues. We're just not well, there. There's, there's, there's two thoughts around uh, both the question that Anne asked and that last point about onboarding. Um, I'll tackle the last one a little bit in terms of what I think. Um, if Catalyst itself and idea scale and everything was too perfect, people wouldn't want to fix it. They'll just accept it the way it is and you know, disappear and stuff like that. At least if it's broken in the sense of hard to find around, people want to fix it. And that means they care enough to engage and try and fix it. Now, that's what's coming through in terms of the community groups and um, different tools that are coming out of like the voter tool from Catalyst and things like that. They came out of a need that people wanted to scratch. Now, admittedly, not everyone can go off and write code right, to, to fix something. Um, but that's, I think that's a really important property that, uh, that you don't try and over-design something like this to begin with. You let the rules emerge from the bottom. Um, that's a really, really important principle. Um, the other uh, thing more uh, broadly to your question, Anne, is uh, voter apathy. Um, democracy and indeed both representational democracy and indeed we operate in Catalyst here in a direct democracy is exhausting. You know, that's what Angela has pointed to. It really is because you're actually asking people to make lots of different decisions. Right? And we, uh, psychologists and yeah. Um, we've got limits in terms of what sort of decision processes and stuff that we can make. Um, and so, the, first of all, just the sheer number of proposals presented to you, or not even the sheer number of proposals, the sheer number of challenges presented to you becomes overwhelming, let alone going in, driving into them, and you just scroll through and say, when does this end? You know, how do I understand it? That's actually exhausting. Um, so generally what happens um, in the, you know, it, you get what, what's referred to as um, voter fatigue. Um, and the second bit is, well, my vote won't matter. You know, I've only got 2008 or 1008, my vote's not gonna matter, why should I bother? Right? Um, and that's, uh, you know, my, my influences aren't going to change things. And that's true for a lot of people that don't vote in representational democracy, because they don't think their vote's gonna matter. And the problem is that lots of people make that decision. And so you end up with poor choices, um, you know, that don't reflect society's whole um, intent. Uh, so those are generally a couple of the things uh, in terms of challenges associated with direct democracy is that it is quite exhausting. And that's not even considering the catalyst process. I think anyway, in regard to this, I think, for example, when you compare to Polkadot, we have a massive onboarding process. We have even onboarding process in our own languages, right? In Polkadot, you don't have any onboarding because you don't have any projects to participate in. And I see the onboarding process in Catalyst as well, uh, or let's say the structure in general. We are a global community in a permissionless environment. What do we expect? 
we have no master architect. We have nobody who tells you, yeah, when you build your community, you need to use this community, this communication channel. You have to get this website link to this website. No, there isn't, right? So it's the community themselves who sets up this environment and the onboarding process to state it horrible. I mean, in Catalyst, I think we have one of the most effect effective and impressive onboarding processes in all blockchain ecosystems at general, even combined. Then it's funny to see that the people say, yeah, it's overwhelming because what is overwhelming? In Polka, that they don't even would think about the shit because they don't give any shit about it. We say it's overwhelming because we set the standard for ourselves that everybody should have the possibility to participate. This is an extremely high standard, guys. And yeah. it's, we have never even wrote it down. And it's a standard who is established already across all projects and catalysts. And the onboarding process now, it's difficult, it's very overwhelming, but I like to see it as a recruitment process as well. It's still young. We don't, I definitely don't want to have the, the mainstream in Catalyst right now. I don't want to have moon boys hanging around here speaking about shit I don't, which doesn't add any positive value to the yeah. situation. The people who make the way, are mostly people who stay as well. And the onboarding process is, it's a kind of educational selection already. Not everybody yet fits into what we are building here. And that's okay. Um, as long, uh, just last yeah, sentence, sorry. as long yeah. as the intention of these people who make the step, who make their way, as long their aim is to say, hey, it should be inclusive and open to everybody. And that's the case. So I see a lot of beauty and love in the situation. Yeah, and I, I, I concur, Felix, totally. Uh, one of the things I will point out with like, respect to a lot of the other chains, like Polkadot, like Aave, like Alacran, they are actually focusing very much on the technical community. Um, yeah, they're trying to compete in the DeFi space in many respects, which is you know, basically white bros, quite frankly. You know, most of them, you know, want to try and make, make a bit of dosh and all they care about is um, token flipping. Uh, so in those cases, you've basically got um, people who are submitting proposals are typically coming in from um, a development background. So they may already have skills to navigate, you know, complex sort of developer environment. Uh, whereas the Cardano community, and I've had several people say this to me, is vastly different. It's like night and day in terms of the discussions, particularly around Catalyst. I think if we ventured slightly further out, it might not be, but <laughs> um, yeah, so there is a, a quite a big difference in terms of the community makeup. And therefore our expectations, um, I'm a developer, I'm actually more um, uh, comfortable diving into things that are broken you know, don't quite work and figuring them out and navigating them around. But I'm acutely aware that most people are not like that. Um, but it is also, to Felix's last point there, it's a selection barrier at the moment, which is probably a good thing, because if you made it too easy, we would be overrun and our culture wouldn't have been developed yet properly. And then it just becomes meaningless. Exactly. Um, so that's that's a key key thing to keep in mind is that we're actually trying to develop a broader um, culture and what we're actually doing uh, and that's even why proposals you know yeah sure we've got to be strategic in how we write them and stuff but they've also got to try and help uh, in particular the challenges is the key thing here and we don't pay enough attention to the challenges they are the things that uh, direct the direction of what we're actually trying to head in okay those those are what we're trying to do okay um so yeah it's a learning organization and a global environment where we're distributed all around the world and i get to meet fantastic people like you <laughs> that enrich my life in a lot, in a lot of different ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think that's incredibly valuable uh, very very valuable true I mean, yeah very true um, and, example, uh, yeah, sorry, go 
uh, her own experience, for example, here with the Eastern Town Hall, which explains really, for me, really well as well. You know, on the beginning of the Eastern Town Hall, I had an idea, yeah, cool, 500 people, Eastern Town Hall, I'll bring people. And so a KPI to say, okay, measurement of success for a session, how many participants? Now I see also with other projects, I see it from a totally different perspective. I appreciate this call so much because we are six people now sitting in a room. We are not 600, where a conversation couldn't even happen, right? So I moved away also from saying, okay, announcing and all this stuff to say, oh, no, no, no. Keep it small, slowly. When growing, then you grow by a new format where we created the LATAM town hall now. So duplicate, duplicating everything what is learned, help them, support them building up their format. It's like this growth. Hey, cool, it's town hall in Indonesian, Vietnamese, Japanese, Portuguese, and Spanish right now. That's great, right? But staying anyway, any, anyway small. And I think, yes, giving it the time that the right people have the time and the resources to build their culture first. The culture here, I think it's extremely important. Hmm. And just when you said this, Robert, I definitely agree on this, on the person. Ah, and that's, it's, it's the culture that we want to replicate, like going into the land and things like that. Because it's that that's going to keep people coming back. It's that that's going to create, and that's going to then sort of answer the sort of challenges and stuff. Because at the moment, we have, um, I mean, what is good? How do we know what is good? We don't, right? We've all got our own opinions on what is good. Um, and so really, we've got to try and develop that sense. And that's going to come through from the culture, the values and stuff that we, um, you know, surface and that we applaud and that we support those sort of things will come through right yeah it's and it's going to be an ongoing thing it's not going to be uh, something that uh, we just declare it and then hey forget about it it's something that we all have to work on and work towards and then we can solve all sorts of interesting challenges on, on that sort of front so that's the hope at least yeah and i think we can do that we, we can do that. Um, but just keep in mind that this space, i.e. the blockchain space, is replete, full of a lot of dudes that think they know best and they're just interested in uh, flipping those tokens. Um, so when I, I used to think, oh, no, I'm not going to, bother with them too much but now I've got a mission I'm on a mission how can we turn that sort of greed and that focus to good <laughs> that's what I want to do I'm on a mission <laughs> so yeah guys go off and speculate I want you to speculate I want you to flip tokens because you don't know it but you're going to be funding projects um, that's my hope um, in, in terms of what we're doing so that, that's the cross-chain collaboration hmm. challenge reported and funded so Hmm. Well, it was interesting because I was having a conversation yesterday uh, with um, a woman who's on one of my proposals, and she was asking she's uh, she was asking about um, cross chain collaboration, and because uh, she felt I, I can't go into what she's doing, but basically it was a, an issue was um, going to this blockchain going to be a problem, and my comments to her first and foremost is like um, in the terms of the blockchain space um, we are tiny we're really really small on a global scale of things at the moment really small that's all the blockchains sure it gets a lot of press and things like that and it seems exciting but in reality it's actually really really tiny um, and so therefore we're not in a, a mode of competition yet we're in a mode of collaboration because ideally we want to try and increase the pie. Uh, what is happening, I've noticed across quite a lot of the chains um, in terms of Hydra, Algorand, Algorand I always get that wrong, uh, Tessos, uh, and a few others, they're all moving towards the notion of impact. They're all pushing that quite a bit. Um, so, you know, doing things for impact related you know, climate and social impact. 
uh, Kadana was really the first one to really do that on a re, as a general purpose chain. There were a few others like Regen and uh, a few others on Cosmos, IXO and stuff that was trying to do it early on. But Charles was really the first one that was pushing that idea right? um, in terms of economic identity and egalitarian and equality. Um, so we're really small in the space. So we shouldn't be competing, we should be collaborating. Right? If there's a competitor to us, Cardano, or any of the other chains, it's the existing way of doing things. Yeah. And so we're, we're here to try and figure out better ways. And that should be all of us trying to figure out how to do that, whether we're in Cardano or Algorand or, or Ethereum, um, those sort of things. Yeah. So cross-chain, I was really pleased to see that Felix come up, uh, cross-chain collaboration stuff. There's a lot to come. Hmm. Well, because, um, Sorry. It's, it's worth also to see Project Catalyst, because when you take away Project Catalyst, what do you have? You have the people, right? And it might be interesting also to see Project Catalyst as a tool, which, is, which might be useful for several communities, right? Not only our, our community. And Catalyst can also be a tool where you bring, can, as you introduce the same tool to different people, they will work with the tool, but they will do several things with the tool, right? They will not work in exactly the same way. But to provide the same tools to several communities, ecosystem, when looking on Catalyst as a tool, might be a fucking huge impact. So, from our perspective, it's really looked like, okay, how can we use Catalyst to not only, not only for the Cardano community, but allow a whole own ecosystem and community to use this tool to collaborate with our community. So for example, because I mentioned before, right, Polka.Web3 Foundation, they are heavily interested in Project Catalyst. We introduced it to them already. So, hey, look, this is Project Catalyst, this is how it works and everything. And they're also very in, in the mode of, hey, collaboration, how can we work with other communities, other ecosystems together, but on the same way like in Catalyst, like we do in Catalyst, on the bottom-up community approach, right? So because they're both, they're facing exactly the same issue, the transition of power. How do they move the entities away from controlling everything over to how can the community now control everything in a decentralized way? That's a huge challenge. Nobody knows how to execute. Nobody knows how to look like, how this will look like. And the problem is now also in our different ecosystems and communities, we work on the same challenges without speaking to each other. We don't have any access to our resources, experience, knowledge, or whatnot. And when it comes to onboarding, onboarding is very overwhelming for somebody who never had some tokens, who never heard about NFTs. The easiest way to onboard people is onboard people who know already, hey, what is proof of stake? What is a wallet? What is a stake pool? Well, Polkadot, for example, it's also a proof of stake, right? When to onboarding, the easiest way to onboard is onboard ecosystems who work already on the very same thing as you do, right? And that's kind of really interesting that Web3 Foundation, which is uh, running Polkadot, they're really, really interested in Catalyst and they want to join. But in a way that it's not the entity who guides, in a way that it's the community who guides. And this conversation goes on since a while already. And now, the challenge is voted and funded. It also is, is a direct way to say, hey, okay, when we have projects who are already established, already emerged from within the community, well, anyway, it's difficult for them to survive because what's after Catalyst? What if your project wants to match yours now? You can't rely on 30 or 50,000 for a whole team and everything, right? Over three months, doesn't work. You need other resources in Cardano, after Catalyst, what do we have? We have nothing. We have the C fund. We have a not yet really clear uh, Imorgo fund for 800 million. 
but even the C fund, it's 15 million, something like this. It's ridiculously low, right? Cardano right now is incredibly bad position to really build really big structures, even, for, even led by the community, right? The resources are simply not available yet. How can you make resources available without using your own resources? So yeah, bring other blockchains in, right? We have already Catalyst Natives with Koti as a first pilot. When a blockchain comes in, submits their challenges, brings their treasury, and they pay in their currency. You will increase radically already the amount of available resources without touching any of your resources, right? And it's a direct benefit for the others as well, because when we as Cardano community submit proposals in a Koti challenge, uh, in a Polkadot challenge then, for example, well, we first have to set up a Polkadot wallet, right? They use it as onboarding process now as well. And so there's... you cross pollinate as a result because exactly. people coming in, that's great. The thing now is to, to say, okay, how could it look like that a polka that a dot holder can get a snapshot of its dots translated into ADA, for example, so that they also can vote, right? Because with their dot wallet, well, they wouldn't be able to vote right now. They would first have to transform it as well, swap it to, into ADA, register first, take click, click all the stuff, but Angela here, shut up. Sorry, I shut up. No, it's interesting. Um, I, 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 in reaction, reaction to that kind of, sorry, my ineloquence is showing itself, but if I can just speak. <laughs> um, in terms of resources, I am so grateful that both you and Robert and Felix have been willing to support us in East Africa this far. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a big and a scary journey to take on something like change the current situation. That's really scary and really overwhelming. And I'd just like to thank you for sharing your resources in terms of patience, in terms of time, in terms of uh, openness to share information. Thank you so much for sharing because the resources are not only money, the resources are also the depth and experience of the humans already in the ecosystem. And so taking on a project like Grow Africa, Grow Cardano, um, you know, with WADA or just the basics of um, where Charles would like us to get to um, that's quite overwhelming and it's quite a big project and it's quite scary in my opinion as someone who's taking it on. And I'd just like to thank you for sharing what you do have um, and for your support and as much backup as you've been able to offer. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be honest. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. How many of the Tanzanian proposals made it through? Because I know you submitted a, a bunch. So. Yeah, we had 25 and 4 won, so that's 0.16%. Uh, Four won? I don't get it. 0 0.16, I don't know why I keep saying 0 0.16, but 16% of four, four out of six, four out of 25. Okay. So already first step. Congratulations already. So what were the four that got, we got the podcast, we got your small one in, uh, which is uh, education for girls. Uh, what else? You're on mute, Angela. Actually, actually, the education for girls didn't go through. What oh, I got no. through was African children telling African stories. The one with the African storybook, ah, right. which is a digital, a digital, um, a digital repository of stories um, that is um, open sourced. 
And so it's exciting because there is an open source challenge this time around. And so I would like to ask for a little more money for that um, and engage the African storybook more. So that was a surprising one. I mean, the one I pushed for did not go through because I think it had girls and young women. So that clearly is not a thing you do in Catalyst. Um, no, it will be. So we'll we change that. We'll change, change that. The, yeah, yeah, change the title. Yeah, yeah so that it's not it. talking about women. <laughs> yeah. It's like women is out. We don't talk about women in this one, in this environment. No, we'll change that, Anne. We'll get that around. We'll swing that around. Um, helping helping different parts of the community, I think, is really, really important. Um, I should actually dive into that storybook one. I know you presented it, uh, and I'm just trying to remember it. Should I saw the storybook one. I liked it. Yeah. It was pretty good. Yeah, and we yeah it, was, it, was, it, was, it was voted for. Yeah. I think it's because we, I also asked for very little money. Yeah, we've got inspiration to do a similar one in Sri Lanka. We are planning to do this time. So Sri Lankan children oh, also have stories. Yeah. So got an inspiration from that. So hoping to propose it for Sri oh. Lankan kids to tell their stories. Okay, Sri Lankan storybook. Okay, you can do um, yeah. the regional one. African storybook has all the languages, like all African languages, almost all. So it's quite a big project that's been going on. It's been supported by UNESCO. It's been supported. UNESCO is quite big on that one. So it's, it's a good project, I think. It's a good idea. Hmm. I should try it. So, uh, and how long was this going on before you all applied for Catalyst funding? And how did you all fund it at, the, at that earlier stage? This, I, joined, I joined Catalyst in November 20, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> but prior so to that, how did the storybook project? Ever. How did the storybook? Oh, the African storybook, storybook project. project that's a very old. Yeah, yeah. The African storybook project has been going on for a long time, and um, it, uh, you know, I I come from a background of education where I have been working with um, with um, digitization uh, of um, the whole digitization process. Uh, in education for children, for schools. And so when we put in uh, computers in schools, we also look for open source materials. We also put in servers in schools to try and get offline sort of versions, offline materials, offline libraries that children can use, um, but they're still digital. So the African Storybook is one of the biggest repositories and libraries of African stories. And then the beauty about it is that the children write those stories. Those stories are written by children and illustrated by children. And then they are also um, available yeah, in the I languages of the children. Yeah, so you can just take it and use it in any scenario. So I've, I've done quite a few uh, activities where I take stories of the African Storybook and put them in the devices that I have put in schools. So I've done that many times over. Um, and so we have one big project with Concordia University. That would be an interesting one to look at um, with a project called um, Abracadabra. So in Abracadabra, we have a component called Reads. And from Reads, we have Reads just stands for Repository of Digital Stories. And um, um, you can, it's been sort of incorporated in, uh, there in, in the Abracadabra. So you can incorporate it. You can take the African storybook and turn it around and incorporate it into um, anything that you're doing. It's a repository. It's just an open repository of more than 4,000 um, 4, uh, books written by children and in their language. How many years? How many years uh, did it take to accomplish that quantity? Eh? Like, is it like decades? Or the African Storybook awesome? Project? Oh, African Storybook Project. I'm not sure how old it is, but I plugged into it. I've been, but I'm not, I, I'm not sure I remember when it started. So it's been going on for a long time. But I plugged into it through Concordia University with the Abra Abracadabra. And I used the reads to, we put the Abracadabra in the, in the schools. Um, and if I understand, so 2016? the idea is to... 2016 is when I plugged in, but I'm not sure how long the African Storybook Project has been going on. I'd have to research it a little bit to find out. So essentially it is to create reading materials for kids 
even if they are online or not it's online both to, it's actually to, yeah, they they are online but they can be on uh, available like for example you would put we would put them in the computer you can just go use use uh, ipv6 and stick them in there um and so they get available even on the computers of the children and they are so to speak offline they don't need the the internet but they can use the the they can use the server the server whatever server specifications you, you have in your computer you can install the african storybook um it actually reads you can install you can install it inside the computer but it's available as a on the warm server as a digital repository but it is offline you understand what i mean yeah yeah got it you can also print them <laughs> if you want but there are too many so we make them available as digital stories really and well, what's the access because they are digital what's the access like for uh computers or phones Well, well you just you make it very simple and you make them just sit on the desktop. Okay. And the children just come every time the child is playing with their tablet the stories are sitting right there they can just click and they'll read the stories. Um also they they can have an audio audio availability where the story is available in the language that they speak so that they can avail the story both in English and in the language that they speak and that improves understanding of the story. and in, improves their the two languages it's quite so is that I love audio that recorded I'm by not so surprised it was voted for is the audio recorded like by humans or is it yes, they're audio a machine picking up audio, the yes audio audio using html so that means it's not a human voice that has recorded it but it's a uh, machine no, it's voice, a human voice reading out no 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 human voice human voice but i suppose you could put a machine voice there as well but normally it, the the work was done by humans and it was a lot of work because i know some of my friends who had to go to canada and read stories and translate stories and read them in kiswahili so the idea is human voice as much as you can but i suppose you could put a a robot there my aunt is in tanzania so uh, i'm close to that area as well she does mission work in tanzania and i was in malawi for three and a half years so that's also quite close to my heart yeah the african story book has been used in tanzania in malawi because the stories are available in kiswahili and maybe a few other languages and also i'm sure they are available in chichewa um you will find the stories in those languages as well I'm going to have to go and get um a drink of water or something. I'm burning up here. Go to sleep. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll do that. I'll do that in a moment. Yeah. It's you promise? Really, yeah. It's just really hot here today. Uh, I don't like Angela, it. what were your other projects that came through just to find out? I didn't win any, but we as East Africa had 25 and 4 out of 25 won. Uh yeah, we what had was the um, one? uh janti's project in congo we had two the amharic podcast in ethiopia and the other ethiopian one and then the african story book um let me find the links the half so the wada you are not counting the wada ones that's separate is it yeah we're not wada yeah, we're okay. trying to um nothing against wada we're trying to um show that east africa is a very 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 different region from west africa and east africa has its own stories and its own drama and its own problems to solve and so no this is not wada okay um what was the performance of of uh the proposals themselves so the even ones that didn't get um funded how many didn't get approved Do you want to take over? Um first we had the proposals two of them were uh, approved and one of them was not approved we had three proposals the ones that were approved it was the one uh, 
build Kadano community uh, in Tanzania. And another one that was approved was uh, Plutus Catalyst Resources in Swahili. Uh, and the one that wasn't approved is um, SPO in trading and trading. So what we see, uh, the community, I've got the results up here. Uh, so the, the community event ones were, um, what was it and the, again? And the, the Banking the Unbanked was approved. Was it? It was, okay. it was approved, but not, what, what's the, what's the status? Not approved or? Funded, not funded, funded or not approved. The distinction okay, between so not, not, not funded means it was approved? Yeah, so approved basically, uh, not approved basically means that there's, uh, I think it's about 10% difference between the upvotes and the downvotes, uh, 10 or 15%. Oh. That's what it means. So you've got to have more than 10% difference uh, between the up and up and downs. Um, so that's what not approved So the banking, means. the unbanked, the unbanking, the unbanked was also not funded, but approved. Okay. And, but the um, others were all not approved. Mine were all not approved except the one that was funded. Okay. Um, so is it? But quite I think a lot it's of... got to do with what you said. And for my, for me, it's really got to do with aligning to the challenges. Um, when I was putting in the proposals, just like you, I was not really putting them in to win. I was kind of putting them to put my ideas out there and to see how they would perform. Um, but I think in this particular fund, maybe it's easier to align them to the challenges that are coming up. And maybe, and do, we did do not you have, have a link? Africa group done. Uh, and do, do you have one a link to one of the proposals which got approved, which was voted but not funded, for example? Do you have a link? Uh, yeah, I just can find a, it. A ideas yeah, sure. Yeah, let me let me get it. Uh, Evan, you've got one as well. What uh, that was in the community events, was it? Um, grow the one, the one for building Cardano community in Tanzania was in the community events, which we were looking for to conduct yeah, seminars. Uh, and the other was multilingual resources. I think so. The challenge was multilingual resources, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The one of Plutus Catalyst resources in Swahili. Wasn't too bad a rating that build Kadano community Tanzania one. Um, it's about mid midfield in terms of the rating. I think I will I will put together a report and get back to you with the full exactly what happened. But um, we had too many similar ish proposals in the community one. So we had three from Ethiopia one from uh, Uganda, two or three from Kenya and two from Tanzania that all, if we now collaborate on building like one hub with one SBO support situation, we will now do better. We, would, we didn't manage to collaborate in time. And so the, there was an issue with the voting seeing many different proposals named East Africa, but not knowing which one to choose, I think. Yeah, and sometimes I'm just looking at the list here and the community events ones, right? And one that stands out quite uh, firmly for me is like Haskell and Coffee. Now, that could easily be an event in Ethiopia or Tanzania, right? I wouldn't know, but hey, Haskell and Coffee, cool. Let's go and have a coffee and learn a little bit about Haskell. Boom. You, you, you know, you're catching, catching the mind. And uh, you, we've got like Dumpling's Twitter space uh, got voted as well. And she's doing, uh, from all accounts, amazing work in China. Um, so she's built up quite a bit of uh, profile. Um, but we've got, let's see what didn't get, uh, add a calendar for community events, didn't get voted, but it was fairly, uh, get, didn't get funded. Grow Afritin, Grow, Kirano, ER, Gardner. So that, I, I don't know what that's specifically going on about. I presume teenagers in Ghana. Um, and then, so 
Yeah, I the, the ones that um, have come through in terms of the community one, insight sharing is quite distinct. Idea Fest, everyone knows about Idea Fest. So the first community event ones are all the well-known um, community groups, um, you know, Swarm related, Kadano for Climate. Um, but then you've got uh, things like clubs and hackathons. So hackathons are cool. Uh, Haskell and Coffee, uh, TiVo's mini proposal workshops. Um, so they're all quite good, um, you know, titles. I think those, those ones that are in there are all quite good. Um, so rather than say, um, build Cardano community in Tanzania, which is a bit generic, to be honest, um, sure. why, why not, you know, try and say, this is specifically what we're going to do. And yeah, the proposal was about build Tanzania, but capture the imagination and the title. So a, a good example is the one that, you know, I've got, got funded, went through multiple titles and I changed the title to suit the challenge. The body of the proposal mm. remained the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you had to sort of fit the challenge in particular because uh, one CA is coming in, are uh, conditioned already, because they're going off to read the, the challenge and they're going to go through and say, okay, um, whether they understand the challenge or not, they're going to be reading it and therefore conditioned to think about that. And so they're going to be consciously or unconsciously reading proposals in that context, right? Um, and then the voters are going to be similarly inclined on going into community events. I already know this is about building the community, so I don't need to put that into the title, right? Can, can I share something from a perspective yeah. of a CA or VC? Go, go, Dimitri, go. Right. So uh, as a CA and VCA, so for Angela and Evan, anyone else who is doing a proposal, the job of the CA and or VCA is to analyze your proposal. That is to say, does it meet the criteria of the CA uh, guide? So the CA guide is a very comprehensive document which goes into great detail as to what a good proposal should be like. So if, you, if your proposal matches the criteria of the CA guide and the detailed questions that are laid out in that, um, you have a much better chance of um, getting to the next round um, than if it doesn't. Um, so for example, they've asked multiple questions about the impact, the feasibility and the auditability. And if those questions are laid out step-by-step, step, me as a CA would find it much easier to approve uh, whether or not even I understood the entire details of the proposal. Now, I didn't personally go into proposals that I didn't understand. So I didn't have the time, nor did I have the inclination. So I focused on uh, community events, you know, proposal onboarding, multilingual resources, you know, those sort of non-techy things. But even there, I found that some proposals were vague and some proposals met the criteria what the CA guide told me to look for. So basically, I created my own questionnaire template, which I'm putting forward as a tool to get funded to develop. But basically, that questionnaire template, when I went through the proposal, I was able to take the abstract, vague ideas. I mean, not to say that the proposal was vague, but every proposal is different. So if you go to take it all from scratch, it's very difficult. So what I do is I read the proposal. I see if it matches the criteria set for a good proposal by the uh, CA guide. And based on that, I will give a rationale for my voting. So if it has a good budget, if it has the team members laid out, if it has the profiles of the team members, if it has a very clear, uh, uh, a very clear uh, uh, budget broken down into components, a timeline, a reasonable timeline, not an unrealistic timeline, KPIs, metrics, auditability, contingency plans. So one of the things that most proposals didn't have was a contingency plan. What do you do if you don't have enough funding from this? What's your plan? So even if you say, I will work with what I have and get some more money in the next plan, it's better than not saying anything at all. So uh, that way, at least the CEA knows that you've thought about what to do if you don't have enough money than you plan for. So that way we know that you planned something. So there is a better chance of success than if you 
didn't have a plan. So, um, so from that perspective, one thing you could do is go through the CEA's guide and figure out how a proposal is analyzed. That way you reverse engineer your proposal to fit that. Because the idea may be good, it's just that the proposal has not been uh, put down in the best way to get the best marks from the CEA's. Um, that's one side of it. Um, the other side is always the lower the budget, the better the chance you're going to get through um, in terms of funding. Um, because more often than not, CEAs will uh, spend more time reading something which is asking for an exorbitant amount than something which is asking for a lower amount. Because after all, the budget is still limited. So 20,000 or 200,000 will get more attention than 5,000 or 200,000. Simply because uh, your, the 20,000 is consuming 10%. And we need to be very sure that that person is getting the best, the, the community is getting the best bang for its buck, so to speak. Is it spending that 20,000 great, um, you know, versus is it going to give away 5,000? So uh, you, you're better off going for a smaller budget and building on it little by little, fund by fund, uh, once you get through, because it's all, the CA always looks and sees, is this a first time project or is this a repeat project? And the repeat project will generally get funded more than a first time project. So, uh, so projects that have been there for multiple funds often, uh, find it much easier to get funded because they've been doing so they started off with maybe 5,000 or 3,000 or something and then the next fund they went for another 5,000 or 7,000 then the next fund they went for 10,000 so usually unless it's a having something like with developer stuff where you need more money if it's a community event or something 5,000 to 10,000 max would be the way to go if I was to say um, from what I saw um, that's the one thing and then another thing would be um, yeah, like Robert said, catchy titles, something to spark the imagination, put in video, wherever you can put in video into your proposal, put in testimonies of your proposal, text alone is dry, uh, graphics is better, video is even better. Um, so any anything that involves more video, stuff like that, it's always good. Um, people, not only the CEOs, the voters will love to see a video. Um, and that way during the town hall and other places where you pitch, you are really able to uh, to to promote the video and people will get caught into your vision with the video more than what you say. So these are just a few points. Um, main thing is don't give up. Um, change your other 21 proposals around. Collaborate, maybe melt them down and make one proposal. And uh, I'm sure that you all will get uh, more in the second fund, as, the next fund as well. It's all good, good advice, Dimitri. Yeah, and I mean, I'd say I didn't get funded until fund six, actually. And yet I'd put in proposals and pretty much all the funds up from two, one, two, three, four, five uh, different ones, but I wasn't overly worried by that. Um, and just get, get going. So that's the rule of thumb largely <laughs> to make sure you don't give up you keep trying and that we can have Haskell and coffee in Tanzania <laughs> and thank you Dimitri for that that was very useful I've taken some notes I think um, we'll increase our chances much appreciated sure no problem and if you guys want to collaborate on anything please feel free to uh reach out to me as well. I'm always open to collaborate on uh, on projects, even if they are not related to my region. I'm always happy to help out, particularly uh, in projects which are from underdeveloped regions like uh, yours and mine. So I'll be more than happy to uh, be a part of your project in whatever way I can contribute. So I'm not a developer myself, but I do have development resources. So any development that is needed can be done as well as my individual skills are marketing, selling, and storytelling. Plus, I have uh, a translation capability. So I do translation in a whole bunch of languages. Um, so anything that's required in any of those areas, whether it's me personally or the developer resources that I have, I'll be more than happy to uh, collaborate on those. Did you have any um, proposals on Dimitri? Yeah, I'm going to have about 25 myself by the looks of it. You're going to have 25. I didn't have any. 
<laughs> I didn't have fun. I, no, I, see, I'm collaborating with multiple teams. So it's not me personally who's putting in 25, but I'm collaborating with a bunch of teams and all of them together, if you count, it's going to be about 20, 25. I haven't even made, made a list of them yet. Um, and some of these collaborations have been built up through my involvement in fund six and seven. So there could be linguistic resources, there could be marketing, uh, you know, linguistic collaboration, marketing collaboration, developer collaboration. So different people want different things from me. So in that way, I get to participate in their project. So I haven't got anything in fund seven. I was too late to apply for fund seven, but I am making sure that I have my, uh, you know, ducks lined up for fund eight. So all the proposals are being got ready so that the moment I want to ask when the placeholders will be open. So I immediately want to get some placeholders put in um, so that I can put my projects in. So I'd like to find out that maybe you guys will know that. But uh, fund eight, I'm coming out uh, because I've got South Asia Town Hall already all, also there. So they need a lot of uh, resources for South Asia. Um, so they will have a bunch of proposals. I've got multilingual uh, stuff going on for all the Indian languages, and Sri Lankan languages, and uh, video projects to do stuff on the proposals themselves. Like the, okay, uh, one thing I can invite you guys is I'm planning on doing like small video clips and to create a YouTube channel. And when you all do your proposals for fund date, uh, what I would like to do is to incorporate your small videos where I would could give you like a small interview, like a five minute interview or a seven minute interview. Seven is a uh, interesting number to me. Um, seven is the number of completion. So I would like a seven minute interview on each project um, and then feature that on a YouTube channel and apply for funding in fund date itself. So when fund date comes around, there'll be 20 to 30 videos already there talking about um, projects that are already in fund, uh, fund uh, eight. And you guys can take those videos and use them in your own, uh, you know, marketing uh, pictures in various town halls and whatever you want. So that way it's useful for you as well. So I would like to do that with you all from the get go. Like we don't need to wait until fund date is announced. We can start working on those immediately. Basically it's a seven minute Zoom call, um, which we will record and then use that on the YouTube. So that way I'm going to set up the channel. So maybe I'll get a couple of hundred um, uh, interviews done by the time uh, fund date voting comes around. So maybe that's of interest to you guys. Indeed. Uh, it's something similar to what Mi is doing from a Vietnam perspective, same sort of thing. She uses three to five minutes uh, videos to do the interviews and um, we're putting those up on the Eastern Town Hall site when she does them. Uh, and Yuta does a different format, which is he goes, he was going through and reviewing the proposals himself, just reading them and talking about the proposals, or at least that's what I could tell he was doing, because obviously I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> um, but that, that's, uh, that's what I you think that. he was, that's what you think he was doing. Yeah, that's what, what I think. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, Yuta's usual style of quite animated, which is always always uh, brings a smile to my face when I see it. So, uh, his, his, his enthusiasm for everything. Um, so that, those were two sort of formats that we did um, this time around. Uh, we in Fund Six we did much higher quality production for the Eastern Town Hall videos. Um, to uh, well, they were just scripted and recorded for about one minute or so um, and then we did the editing and well Jack did the ed editing um, to bring them up to scale on those sort of things so um, yeah video is a very useful tool uh, to get ideas across um, really useful on that front yeah so anything else uh, people would like to cover at all any other topics of interest that you want to go over um, or I might disappear <laughs> we would like I to think send we to should bed. end the meeting yeah. yes let's send Robert to bed yeah. uh, we should end the meeting in six minutes at the top of the hour <laughs> top of the hour okay I'll hang him for six minutes I'll hang him in there I was thinking that um, uh, Dimitri one of the things um, like um, that I would like to do 
uh, in the Eastern Town Hall and, you know, I'd say also with the other groups, is try and elevate the uh, importance of the challenges and get people thinking about them um, and how to, uh, you know, write proposals for a given challenge. So one of the things is not just focus on proposals, proposes, but actually also do stuff with the challenges themselves and highlight those because they will help people understand what's actually required in the challenge. Um, so for example, yeah, to me, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so your analysis of as I'm a CA, this is what the challenge means to me. Uh, and uh, how I would interpret any proposals coming through would be actually incredibly valuable for people. So, yeah, I guess I could do a video on that and put it up as well. I mean, no yeah. need to restrict it just for proposal. It can be a multi, um, how shall we say, multi beneficial or multi angled um, uh, resources for Catalyst or something like that. Hmm. So it's not just proposals and proposals, but it can be what other people might say, how they, uh, you know, interpret stuff or whatever, so that the proposal proposers can gain whatever benefits from different people looking. Maybe a voter can say how he votes, what does he look for when he's voting, um, like that. Or a VCA can say what does he look for when he's uh, analyzing the CA's um, uh, reports, uh, assessments, you know, stuff like that. So there is benefit for everybody. Ultimately, the, the purpose is to bring everybody up to a higher level and thereby elevate the entire um, quality of proposals and um, the, the community as a whole. So yeah, what you say definitely will have value. So let's let's do that, Robert. Uh, yeah. Whenever you're ready, we can do a video of you uh, uh, talking about the respective challenges and even your own proposals. I know you have multiple proposals to come yeah. in fund yeah. so you can talk about this. Uh, I, I don't think I'll be put, I'm trying not to put any in for um, <laughs> I'm sure people will add me to their proposals, but uh, I'm really trying not to. Uh, I've, got, I've got enough. <laughs> you said you, you have enough to deal with. You said that you would um, create a challenge first. Could you just for next week or next next week? Uh, next town hall. Um, I think we could do a sort of challenge fest and go through each of the challenges, whether it's actually the proposers of the challenge or whether or not um, it's the uh, um, us, so, some of us going through and analysing them or just talking about them for two minutes and then asking questions. Um, so it gives people a sense of what sort of proposals. But the other thing too I was thinking about is like we can use this forum here on Eastern Town Hall in the English room to actually go through proposals that you might be working on. And I often, we've done that in the past, uh, where we can say, right, I'm thinking of putting it into this challenge. This is what I think the title is and why, and can work through and provide suggestions on that side of things. That's also stuff we can do um, to help refine what, what's going on. Um, so, uh, you know, talk more through the proposals uh, and not just talk through them, but actually try and solicit critique or suggestions or what do you think this is, you know, the kind of reviewing it would be quite a useful thing, I think, uh, if, if that's helpful. We can apply a critical eye to, to the proposals themselves. And we all learn as a result from doing that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's another sort of thing that people are interested to do that in the room. We could do that. So, um, yeah, I'd quite like to go through the challenges. I, I really do think that they need to be highlighted a lot more, um, both in terms of what challenges have been funded and also the challenge setting itself is incredibly important because that sort of stuff sets the direction and the tone of the subsequent funds. Um, so, you know, that is, that is something to really look at um, you know, in terms of what's going, what's going on. Um, you know, it's important. Okay. Right. I think uh, I'll call it a, a day because I am really fading. <laughs> I'm surprised I lasted this long, to be honest. Um, so we'll 
call it quits for for tonight and as always it's really really lovely to talk to you all and see all these uh, beautiful faces beautiful people coming along you know i usually like to see felix's face but obviously something's going on with his camera <laughs> uh, robert if you don't mind before you go yeah. uh, would you be able to send send me on telegram last time on one of the when you spoke at i think it was c4c you mentioned a bunch of books that were useful for um uh, these areas of uh, uh, networks and collaborations and what not um if you could share those books um, just in a telegram message you don't need to do it now i mean go to sleep yeah i'm just trying to remember uh, what books were they uh, this was in a little fish session or was this um, honestly yeah, the last couple of weeks it was yeah uh, it was within the last week or two uh, either little fish or c4c you spoke you spoke at length about yeah. accounting and multiple accounting and various things because one of the proposals i'm putting in is to translate a bunch of these books that are relevant to, to catalyst it, it into, wasn't this uh, one no i can tell you that much i can tell you that much oh, uh, uh, yeah well oh, tin damn bloody <laughs> um uh, this is sitting on my desk because i was talking about it this morning to someone oh. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say have was Have you seen uh, the you Hitler Moonad books. thing? Um I have. <laughs> It's hilarious. <laughs> I thought it was really funny that one. <laughs> um okay. So this one here. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, I can't read it but whatever it is if it's good just send me the No, you wouldn't want to read this. This is algebraic models no. for accounting systems. She wouldn't want to read it. Um, it's it's just sitting on my desk. Um, maybe not. <laughs> um, I mean, so whatever you think is relevant for a catalyst audience to gain, it could be on entrepreneurship, like marketing, economics. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. Is, yeah, I'm trying is, to think. I'm trying just, to think. Yeah, I'm trying to think which one. Not just local. Uh, yeah, I'm not talking about my local languages. I'm talking about a bunch of languages that are relevant to catalyst like i'll pick the five most popular languages and create a translation of the book with the funding received so it could be that tokenomics book is one example then impact networks by david ehrlichman is another example then it could be other books relating to uh, uh, networks or collaborating which you know of robert it could be some sort of accounting book that deals with things that are not necessarily being done at the moment um something to do with the blockchain that makes information easily available on the blockchain so yeah. these would be resources that any catalyst person should read whether he is a proposer or not in order to uh, get a better understanding of uh, cardano the blockchain catalyst you know collaborations english language entrepreneurship whatever those are areas to look at so since you are a reader and definitely i know you know books that we don't know so um, please do suggest anything that you think <laughs> my my books are, are a bit weird um but um <laughs> because they're quite technical sort of books um most of the stuff i read um economics and cross the board but i'll have a thing um i know i mentioned some i'm trying to remember which ones i mentioned i can't actually remember uh, i think i mentioned about 3 in that little fish session but i can't actually remember which ones i did uh so yeah i'll i'll have a little think um and see what i can do okay all right thank you no hurry just whenever you can yeah um uh, yep yeah, i can do that okay well have a good day everyone uh, bye bye all uh, and we'll see you all later and we'll see you next time uh, it's lovely to see you bye okay thank you bye kurang lebih kayak gitu. Jadi kalau okay. VCA ini pertanyaan bagusnya dari Bruce Arbel. Kalau VCA bisa menjadi CA juga berarti iya bisa merangkap. Problemnya kalau men- udah jadi CA terus jadi VCA itu kalian harus milih kategorinya nih. Kalau kalian assessment nih misalkan di Cardano uh, scale up hub eh, Cardano hub ya. Itu kalian pas jadi VCA kalian tuh nggak boleh uh, nge-review <laughs> semua assessment yang ada di kategori yang kalian masukin Jadi CA gitu loh. Jadi kalian sebagai VCA harus milih kategori lain untuk ngeceknya. Apalagi yang kemarin saya jadi proposer juga kan. Saya jadi proposer tuh di Cardano uh, Scale Up. 
pas saya jadi CA, saya nggak boleh ngakses uh, proposal yang under kategori yang saya masukin proposalnya. Kemudian saya pas saya jadi VCA, saya nggak boleh uh, nge-review yang saya jadi proposer dan kategori yang saya ngasih CA. Kayak gitu. Jadi cukup kompleks juga kalau kalian jadi proposer, jadi CA, dan VCA. Kurang lebih kayak gitu. Semoga menjelaskan. Kalau ada pertanyaan jadi VCA, silakan juga. Bisa ditanyakan juga. Mungkin Bro Dani mau nanya VCA, penasaran? Kerja Rodi? VCA, tergantung nanti. Ya, yeah, oke. Okay. Tergantung nanti. Mau lanjut VCA atau enggak? Kan minimal dua fund ya? Eh, yeah, minimal dua fund. Terus kalau yeah. kayak yang tadi Bro Yan bilang, kalau jadi VCA, kalian itu nama kalian tuh terpampang. Jadi kalau ada yang komplain, misalkan proposernya komplain, dia bilang, saya uh, ngeflag ini kenapa kalian tetap Uh, misalkan ada ases, uh, asesor atau CA yang ngasih nilai tiga bintang ke satu proposal. Kemudian uh, proposernya ngasih flag ke asesmen ini. VCA-nya ngelolosin aja nih. Nah itu si VCA-nya harus bertanggung jawab kenapa dia meloloskan atau kenapa dia nge-filter out juga si asesmen dari CA. Jadi kalian jadi lebih kayak hakim gitu. Kalian mau lolosin, fil- uh, nge-filter, mau lolosin kasih good excellent atau nge-filter out suatu asesmen. Nah itu, dan nama kalian terpampang. Kalian bisa dituntut lah kayak gitu oleh publik. Kalau CA, itu kalian nggak kelihatan namanya. Cuman asesor 1, asesor 100, asesor 50, something like that. Jadi ya, kalau mau aman, nggak mau namanya terpampang, jadilah CA. Tapi kalau kalian udah punya pengalaman dan emang mau jadi VCA, lebih suka jadi VCA, ya become VCA. Kurang lebih kayak gitu. Oke, okay. hi Robert. Oke. Okay. So, ada pertanyaan lagi? tentang CA, VCA, proposer, um, atau hanya sekadar pengen jadi voter. Kalau mau jadi voter, yang penting bikin wallet di Cardano pakai Daedalus, Nami, uh, Yoroi, CC Vault, sekarang ada Gero sama Flynn juga. Kemudian minimal harus ada 500 ada. Saya nggak tahu apakah requirement-nya berubah di fund 8, kalau lebih rendah lagi atau enggak. Yang saya ingat waktu di fund 3, itu minimum 3.000 ada untuk bisa voting. Nah, ini ada pertanyaan dari Bro Sharbel. Saya jadi CA biar dapat reward supaya bisa 500 ada lalu bisa voting yes. <laughs> Benar. Kalau nggak punya ada, tenang aja. Jadi CA, dapat reward. Nah, kalian di fund berikutnya bisa voting. <laughs> Bagus idenya. Atau jual satu NFT tuh, Bro Andre bilang. Pavia kemarin baru jual, baru jual whitelist. <laughs> Oke, ada pertanyaan lagi? Silakan, Bro Yan. Ada tambahan? Uh, enggak sih, lebih ke ide sih sebenarnya. Kayak ke Mas Andi kan ini ya. tapi ini pasti konflik of interest sih dia kan dosen di kelas emargo uh, apa foundations of blockchain mm-hmm. nah itu kan kalau semua mas anti mau itu semuanya bisa diarahkan untuk bikin proposal dan itu oh, ada betul. ada sistem referer nah, oh ya situ, tadi <laughs> ya. nah itu. ini buat info teman-teman di fund 7 kemarin saya kan majuin proposal nah referral 